Up next, the story of one of the most haunting songs of the mid-90s is told by one of the most iconic bands of the last 25 years. With speculation having run rampant on the meaning of this number one alternative rock song, we actually get the straight story from the band's frontman and songwriter in an exclusive and personal interview next on Professor of Rock. Hey music junkies, Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. Uh, you know, if you love the history of music, rock, pop, and soul, you get it straight from the artists who created those songs, you're going to want to be a full-time part of this channel by subscribing below. We'd love to have you. Make sure that you hit the bell so you always get our daily features. Um, also, check out more of our content at our page on Patreon to become an insider to help us get more videos and, and do this thing. So it's time for another edition of our new show, Breakthrough. This is a third or fourth episode. This is where we break down the singular song, album, or event that uh, kicked open the door to an artist or band's career, and that gave them the momentum to rocket to long-term success. Today's a great one, as we uh, get the story from John Resnick, the iconic frontman, guitarist, and songwriter from one of the biggest bands of the last quarter century, Goo Goo Dolls. Their number one airplay hit, if you remember, Iris, from the 1998 movie City of Angels, who could forget it? Cause I don't think they'd understand. That rocketed the band to the highest levels of global stardom. Uh, Iris was perched at the top spot of the airplay charts for like uh, a record 18 weeks since it wasn't commercially available as a single. It uh, wasn't allowed to chart on the Billboard Hot 100, which was really strange, but it's become one of the biggest songs of the last 30 years. I just want you to know who I am. And the band was ready for that major success because of their 1995 album, A Boy Named Goo. That put them on the fast track. And our breakthrough story begins where a, a rough and ready punk band would scratch and claw its way uh, from Buffalo, New York to get a record deal. It was the trio of guitarist Johnny Resnick, bassist Robbie Tackick, and uh, drummer George Tatuska. Uh, they would choose the name Goo Goo Dolls as a temporary fix, a uh, temporary name. Resnick wasn't even the, the singer on the first few albums. But after fighting their way through, you know, releasing the first uh, three albums, those early ones, and having the opportunity to open for Johnny Resnick's Heroes, The Replacements, one of my favorite bands, this was on their final U.S. tour, Goo Goo Dolls released the LP Superstar Car Wash that was in uh, 1993, where Resnick's collaboration with The Replacements revolutionary leader Paul Westerberg uh, we Are the Normal, that helped them get play on MTV's 120 Minutes and alternative rock stations. Normal, as well as an appearance on the Pauly Shore movie soundtrack, Son in Law, the pump was primed and the band was really ready to make its climb. Their breakthrough came in 1995 with the release of A Boy Named Goo. It was a slow burn, you know, the first two singles, only one and a flat top. They weren't big hits, but everything changed with the third single that was titled Name. Very personal song that Resnick wrote almost by accident and was never considered a big contender for a hit single. The song was rumored to have been written about MTV VJ Kennedy, remember her, uh, about her complicated relationship with Resnick. In fact, uh, in Kennedy's book, uh, The Kennedy Chronicles, she talked about this. Uh, I think Resnick actually alluded to it as well. No the song is about many different things. Uh, very personal, like I said, and this is uh, something that Resnick talks about in our interview. It's a very fascinating and vulnerable story from John about a song that pushed the goose over the top. Name was a true crossover hit. It went to number one on the mainstream rock charts. It went to number one on the alternative airplay charts. Number two uh, on the mainstream top 40. Number five in the AC charts. And the pop billboard Hot 100. It also went to number two in Canada. Me, maybe for, a while. for all of you chart geeks out there, probably be interested in this. In 2012, Name was ranked number 24 on Billboard's top 100 pop songs for the 10 year period of 1992 to 2012, that chart. The Goo's also ranked at number nine with Slide and at number one with Iris. 
That made the Goo Goo Dolls the only musicians to have three songs chart on that list, two breaking the top 10 and all three falling within that top 25. Uh, name was the breakthrough, and now we get the story behind it from John Resnick. Because of the anomaly with Iris, Name is actually the Goo's biggest Hot 100 hit. So let's get the story from John right now. As we go into this interview, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear. These are my new clear glasses that I got. Uh, I sport on here daily. If you're looking at getting a new pair of frames or even sunglasses with summer coming, do yourself a favor. Go to zenny.com where you'll have an amazing variety you can choose from. You can see how you look before you buy when you use uh, Zenny's mirror feature that they have there. Try it today. Here is John Resnick with the story. When this record came out, Boy Named Goo, you went to the masses. I mean, it's one thing yeah. to have your song, We Are the Normal, 120 Minutes, but as soon as Name, like you said, you didn't think it was a hit. I mean, it was really an album track, and then they yeah. started to play it. But I want to ask you specifically, Boy Named Goo, it always kind of felt like it was a little bit of a tip of the hat to Boy Named Sue, right? Yes, Johnny absolutely. Cash, yeah, yeah, know? yeah. But Name... It's also not only that as, as far as a track on, on the album, but it was an accident when you wrote it. I always heard the story that you were strumming, just kind of messing around with chords and yeah. stuff. And because yeah. it's in a strange tuning. I mean, yeah, it, tell me that story. That's a, that's a great story. Well, we were, we were a three piece. Um, we were a three piece band. And I was also such a huge fan of Who's Could Do. And Soul Asylum, you know, to a lesser degree. Waiting by the phone, waiting for you to that whole sound, I could relate to that whole, they had this great music scene there. And I could relate to it being from Buffalo, which is basically, oh, yeah. you know, just east of the Midwest. Songs like Hardly Getting Over It. And Paul's Ballads. I mean, Who's Do and Replacement Ballads. They're just like, that's what... Unsatisfied. Yeah, oh my God, man. <laughs> Answering machine? You know, it's crazy. And I think that was part of what the abrasiveness of their sound. There was so much beauty underneath it. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's songs that I listed, like Divide and Conquer, when I, or, or Games. That, yeah. that song kills me when I hear it because I'm just, I listen to the lyrics and like what he's saying, you know? Uh, yeah. You know, I could be someone. It's, it's layers. Then, yes. One of the things that I, I'd started delving into was, was uh, using open tunings, alternate yeah. tunings. And, you know, Mould did that you know, to create this sort of sonic thing where there's like, you're filling in space. Right. Like, you know, we're not Rush. You know, right, it's right, like right. Robbie, Robbie's thumping eights. Boom, 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 yeah. boom, boom. That was, that was a trick that, that I think Mould did really well. I read that you were, when you were kind of struggling, you're like, oh, this is cool. Yeah. You had a post-it note that you're writing it down on, right? The tunings? Yeah, the stuff. tunings. I yeah. still do that. <laughs> I still do that. Or I'll put tape on the back of the guitar. And I'll have a tuner, and I'll write the tunings down on it, because I forget, I forget. I want to go through some of the lyrics in this, because I love this song. Of course, number five on the pop charts, it was a crossover hit, because it went number one on the rock charts, number one on the modern rock charts. But when you talk about kind of grown-up orphans, your parents died when you were a very young age. Your uh -huh. sisters, you mentioned your sisters, yeah. they kind of helped raise you and things. Yeah, they was helped Was that out. a little bit of a, a tip to that or? Yeah, it was kind of a thing. God, it's so hard to just put it into words. You know? I know. It, it, it was just one of those things when it came out, I mean, you look at the paper and you're like, oh wow, there it is. I mean, and it's hard to describe what it's about. I mean, there's definitely, there's some stuff truly, truly about my upbringing, you know, and that, and the feel of where I was from, you know, and um, <clears throat> looking back, you know, 15 years later at what it was like to sort of be on your own at such an early age. Scars, 
scars are souvenirs you never lose. I love yeah. that line. That's such yeah. a, the past is never far. Yeah. That, that two lines right there, like, that could have been the whole song for me. <laughs> I mean, that that was such a key line. It was like, Thank you. it was one of those lyrics where there are songs every now and again where you hear a lyric and it just, it just kind of changes the way you look at the world. The wow. Smiths were like that for oh, me. Oh, my know? God. I right? Love the Morrissey. Yeah. Like you say, Husker Du and replacements, but when that, Scars, you know, souvenirs. I mean, that line was like something where I stopped and I, I thought about it. Yeah. And I was like, wow. Way too fast. Now there's nothing to believe. Grew up way too fast. Now there's nothing to believe. Reruns all become our history. A tired song keeps playing on a tired radio. I love yeah. that. A tired song keeps playing on a tired radio. Yeah, that was kind of my, my line was more or less about the way things were in Buffalo at that time. The whole situation was like there, felt very stagnant at that time. Yeah. And Buffalo has had a renaissance since then. It's yeah. become this incredible place. What I love about it is it's not, the song structure is not verse, chorus, verse, chorus. It, it just naturally plays through. This yeah. is, it's not forced at all. It's just, it feels yeah. like you just wrote it across. <laughs> you yeah, know? it's nice when you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Sometimes you happen across the happy accident. And that. then the speed up part at the end, I loved how you did that. How, oh, wow, the, yeah. the, the, the song sped up during yeah. the solo. Yeah, because we weren't playing to a cliff track and we couldn't, and the drummer just sped up. And I was like, well, yeah, it's what it's supposed to do. It lends a sense of urgency to the song. Again, I think it, it's what kind of it lends itself to the song being just a natural thing where it almost felt like it all came out just right there. Like it was recorded yeah. because it speeds up and it's just very natural how the parts all come together. Yeah. No, thank you very much. You know? for, that's, those, those are some very deep observations about that song. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, and the urban legend is always also that it was about a, a girl as well. And Yeah, you know, I'll lie my ass off about stuff. You know what I mean? I'll tell, I'll tell one story one day and one story the next time, <laughs> you know. And it's kind of cool to keep people guessing. I mean, you know, I mean, the entire thing could be some bizarre, uh, you know, apocryphal tale I made up in my head. But right. Yeah, there was a situation like that going well, on, truthfully, yeah. truthfully, you know, yeah, that was, that was part of it. And part of the song was like, I don't know, you know, I don't know if any, any of the other writers that you've interviewed have ever done this, but it's like, I'll write a song and I won't really even know what the hell it's about, but I'll like, it's like I want to hide this nugget as a message to someone, then a message to someone else, yeah. or, hey, that line is about you, and I don't give a shit what the rest of the song about. This line is about you. Do you remember the first time that you heard your song on like a major radio, or where you oh. were that moment? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the first time I I'd heard one of our songs, you know, wasn't it wasn't on the radio, it was in the supermarket. And I, I tell wow. this story sometimes when we're playing because it's 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 it really is the truth. It's like the first time I heard um the song Name. I was I was grocery shopping at like three in the morning, which is what I like to do because <laughs> yeah, yeah. it's just me and the me and the guys that are, you know, out on parole, like stocking the shelves, you know. <laughs> right, like, right, right, right. You know, and just kind of, kind of walking through the supermarket, buying my dog food and all that. And I heard name coming out of the speaker in the ceiling, and it was like, I thought, oh, I mean, it, it was like, wow, you know, we were, we were so cool. We were gonna, we were gonna be these cult figures. <laughs> Love it. Never sold more than fifty thousand records. We were we were well on our way to that to that sort of obscurity that just makes you so important to a small group of people. Right. And then that song came out of the that song came out of the speaker <laughs> in that supermarket, and I was like, ah, oh, it's over. I was amazed how much we caught from people, like the amount. Of of like the whole sellout hate thing and all that. mail that we got about that song. It's like F you go back and listen to all of our albums. You know there yeah. was always a ballad on there. We made that record for eighty thousand dollars. You know yeah. we did that entire record. 
I mean, you know, we worked with Lou Giordano and he's like one of the great indie rock producers from Boston. And we didn't know we were gonna have a hit. Well, you guys started yeah. with We Are The Normal starting to kind of bubble up. And then you, yeah. of course, had Falling Down on the Pauly Shore movie, Son-in-Law. I remember mm -hmm. seeing that. And yeah, and we and were everyone's darling at that point. But, you know, people, when you're, when you're in that state of, be, of bubbling under all the time, the only people who write anything about you are the people that like you. And then you get out in the real world, and it's like, you know, people put you on a pedestal just to get a better shot. You yeah. know, and it's like... It's, you know, but, you know, we, we, we hung with it, you know, we had to learn to get tough. Yeah. Now tell me your name. Hey, thanks so much for watching. We really appreciate it. Do leave us a comment about this very personal song. What is your take on it? And uh, what is your take on this iconic band who's still recording good music? What does this song mean to you? We'd love to hear about it in the comments. If you like our content, we do invite you to subscribe now to be a part of this community. Make sure to look us up on Patreon for more content and help support the curation of this content. The history of rock and pop is so important. Help us keep the music alive. Until next time, you remember three chords and the truth. <laughs>